Everyone has a story to tell. Welcome to Dingo Talk, where we explore the experiences that make us who we are. Here's your host, Carlo Guadagnino. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach of the Hamlin University Pipers, Coach Chip Taylor. Coach Taylor is going to talk to us about his time going from New Jersey to Illinois State, where he played his college ball, uh, his time at Valpo, uh, some of the internships that he's done with the NFL. Side note, as a Steeler fan, really cool story that he tells about Mike T. Um, the three years that he spent at Bucknell and then how he made his way to Hamlin in uh, 2013. Um, just little, we also are in the Final Four, so there's only going to be two games this week that we pick. Uh, I had a very terrible week in picks. Uh, Serenity and DB did much better than I did. Um, thank you to Alma, because if it wasn't for you losing, I think uh, Serenity would have gone perfect. So thanks for not letting that happen. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube or listening to us and watching us on Spotify, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Spread uh, the show around. Maybe maybe some other people out there looking to, to hear what these Division three coaches have to say. Um, and if you want to join the conversation, you can follow us on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter and Facebook. The only one that's different is the Instagram page. That's dingo underscore talk. Um, make sure you stick around for overtime. As I said, there's two games that we're picking this week. Uh, Cortland versus Randolph-Macon and North Central versus Wartburg. But before we get to that, we have to hear Coach Chip Taylor's story. And without further ado, this is him. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carlo Guadagnino. This is Dingo Talk. My guest this week is the head football coach of the Hamlin University football program, Coach Chip Taylor. Coach Taylor, thank you for joining us. Hey, Carlo, like I said before, um, before we do anything, I, I really appreciate you reaching out, um, giving us this platform to kind of, you know, visit tonight, talk, um, exchange ideas, philosophies, learn a little bit more about Hamlin, myself, and heck, I can learn a little bit more about you too. So very appreciative of the opportunity. So thank you. When I appreciate you taking the time, especially, you know, with being out in, in in Minnesota and whatnot, you guys with the, with the way your conference is set up, it's it's hard to even get the times right with with me being here and you guys being there, trying to make sure that I don't mess up anything. So I'm really glad that we could finally. I, we've had probably 13 or 14 conversations where it's, hey, we're good for this day. Oh dang, one of yep. us has something come up, and it's so I'm really glad that we could get to do it. I'm gonna do this the same way I do every week. I'm gonna put you in the time machine real fast. We're gonna talk to you about how we got to this point. And then we're going to talk all about the uh, the Piper program. So my first question for you is, how does a kid from New Jersey find his way to Illinois State? Wow. It's a, it's actually an interesting story, and that place is very dear to me. I think I have the – I thought I had the helmet. There you go, the small helmet back there of Illinois State, man. But anyway, um, long to put it long story short, man, I was always the outside type of kid. You know, love, you know, finding a pickup football game, a pickup basketball game, baseball game in the backyard – whatever it was, racing light pole to light pole. Like we were outside kids. So the process of, you know, you're going through high school and you see guys ahead of you from, Will I'm from Willembro, New Jersey. And we had some of the best athletes in South Jersey. And you see letters start coming in from Clemson and Penn State and, and Syracuse. And by the time you're a junior, if that's not happening, probably not getting recruited. You know, I was a big Penn State fan. Like I wanted to go to Penn State. Um, but again, not big enough. Five, eight, uh, junior receiver that runs four, seven is not going to Penn state. This is not <laughs> happening. So with that being said, our, my junior year, when I was playing wide out, our quarterback, Wayne Riley, who was my roommate in college. And I still talk to today. He ended up, you know, our offensive coordinator at, at, at Willowbro high school knew the defensive coordinator at Illinois state. They worked together. So Wayne Riley senior year, he had a solid year, send a tape out to him. They loved Wayne. Wayne went out there, did a good job. My mm -hmm. senior year, I moved into his spot and played quarterback and, um, had a solid year. I was running around, th distributing the ball. I had a Division One tight end as a junior, Sean Phillips. I had a Division One running back, Josh Minkins, that went to Louisville. Sean Phillips went to Purdue. So I had some pieces and weapons around uh, around the around us, and I had a good year. Um, my high school tape wasn't really good enough, so I had. I remember after going out to lunchtime, and Coach Tezik, our offensive coordinator at the time, had to film me, hand film me, because I needed more tape and running routes and doing whatever. And then ended up, um, you know, getting out to Illinois State. And we actually took another kid that was in a class behind us. So it was three of us from uh, from South Jersey um, at Illinois State. And that usually, they, they did not come out there and recruit. It was just a connection from a, the college coach to the high school coach. 
Well, and, and that, it's interesting because, you know, you're you're now on the other side of that and you're doing the recruiting and now sure. getting tape on a, on a kid. I mean, I, I imagine you pull up your Twitter page and there's probably 37, 40 kids right off bat that are, hey, coach, take a look at my film. Take a look at this. You know what I mean? And, and when we were going through the process, that was not the case. I remember putting the DVD together and finding the highlight button and you had to. So I remember sending yeah. DVDs out. So I, yeah. I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, check this out. I'll, I'll, I'll even do you one more solid DVD. I remember sending a VHS because the VHS is out. I, I got VHS right over there, man. So <laughs> I got a high school film right over there that I can pop in it and kind of watch. So yeah, it was it was VHS when I was coming out. So it wasn't DVD. So so what were the four years like at at, at Illinois State? Oh man, <clears throat> challenging. Um, a lot of great relationships. Um, ups and downs, ebbs and flows. So we got recruited by Todd Berry, um, awesome coach. Man, I still talk to Coach Berry today. Mm -hmm. um, he, he was actually a young coach. I think he took over the program in 94 and left in 99. Or he took over Illinois State in 95, um, left in 99. He was a hot up, up and young coach. Um, probably one of, the, one of the main reasons why I got into coaching was Coach Berry. Just the way he could command a room, very good, solid X's and O's, could motivate without necessarily not have to yell and, and be a jerk about it. So – that was good. So 98 was a great season. It was the first year we made it to the uh, NCAA playoffs. Um, and then in 1999, we made a deep run into the playoffs. Um, and I really, and to this day, my teammates, we, we always joke back and forth. The coach Barry would have stayed and our quarterback wouldn't have got hurt in 1999. We probably would have won the champion, a national championship in 99 and maybe in 2000. Cause we were, we were that good. We got ranked as high as number three. Um, wow. So those two years were good. And then I'd say when I talk about ebbs and flows, we had a head coaching change, you know, coach Barry from a professional standpoint, you know, he moved on to Army, um, mm -hmm. took that job. We were, you know, as young people, 19, 18, 20 years old, you know, you're upset that the head coach that brought you there left, but we understood. Uh, Denver Johnson came in, and um, he, had came from, he, he came from Murray State, and it was different, man. You know, when a, a new head coach comes in, they see it. They have their own vision, and sometimes the, the guys that are in the program really don't fit their system or fit the, uh, the culture. So it was challenging, but it was the best thing that ever happened to me from a professional standpoint because I had two different head coaches, saw two different styles, had six different position coaches. So I saw how different rooms were ran. So it was actually a, it was tough at the time, but a blessing in disguise. Now, what were the, what was the biggest difference between their coaching mm -hmm. styles? Cause I think that's mm -hmm. going to lead into my question about your philosophy and how it, how it kind of has changed over the yeah. years, but what was their biggest coaching styles that you, that you noticed? I thought coach Barry did a good job. First of all, super organized. Mm -hmm. um, very, very, very organized, very detail oriented. Um, and, you know, their, their, their whole staff was really good, uh, good teachers. I felt like, um, and this is just me as a, I'm talking about young, as a young player kind of watching from, you know, watching from um, afar. Cause you know, mm -hmm. as a young guy, you're not playing much. Um, so I thought that was the biggest thing for them. And then, you know, just being able to motivate um, and then finding talent. Like we had, a, we had one, two, three, four. We probably had four or five at the one double A level at back then. Probably had four or five guys that played in the NFL. Wow. Um, shucks. Two guys played in the CFL. Kevin Glenn, if you look him up, I mean, he played 15, 16 years in the CFL, played for every team in the CFL as a quarterback. You know, my roommate Sam Young played seven years in the CFL. And uh, we had one, two, I think about three or four guys that were on NFL, NFL rosters. So from, from a talent standpoint, um, I thought they did a great job um, of getting getting the right kind of guys in there. And then when a new head coach came in, you know, they had a different, you know, just a different philosophy, different offenses. You know, Coach Barry's offense was a little bit more triangle oriented, get the ball out. Um, you don't have to read hot quarterback needs to know as soon as we're, if, if a guy's blitzing, ball goes here, you know, mm -hmm. and it was e really easy on the receivers to know, okay, all I got to do is run this route. And if it's, if it's a, I don't have to break my route off where when we got into that new defense, uh, the new offense with Coach Johnson, it was a, it was a little bit more pro style. We, they pushed, we pushed it down the field a little bit more, but there were some things that, you know, and I remember we spent a lot of time on, Hey, if these two guys blitz, you got to break a route off. It's like, that takes, that's expensive, man. That takes a lot of time. You know, yeah. you only have a certain amount of time to work with, to work with um, uh, student athletes. And I just remember being, I thought coach uh, Barry's offense was a little bit more quarterback receiver, running back friendly, but coach Johnson's offense was a little bit more like pro style. We're going to take our shots. So, um, so not, nothing bad, just, just a little bit different, just different styles. And then, so why, why did we, why, when you graduate, was it time to go into coaching? Why did you feel that was the path for you? No, it's a, that's a, that's an awesome question. Um, I can just remember two, two things. I can remember sitting in my DB's coach's um, office, coach Ron Lambert. 
I'll never forget. And I was, I just was in there watching. I said, man, this is what this guy does for work. Like he just coaches football, you know? So I thought that was pretty cool. So then I started talking to him and, and like I said, having six different position coaches and two mm-hmm. different head coaches, you see a lot of different ways to do things um, and how you can motivate, how you can treat young people, how you can develop them. And I just thought it would be really cool. To, and, and I'm very competitive um, and I love the game. So I was like, man, maybe I can, you know, try my hand at, try my hand at coaching college football. So. And how did, how did Valpo come into the, cause you, there, there's a couple of stints there too, right? You, you go to Valpo, you're back, you, you go to uh, Rose Hallman. Yep, Rose, right over there, Rose Hallman. You got it. <laughs> and then back to, Val, so there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, up and down there with them. Plus there's some sure. NFL internships that are going on. So how did that all come to come together? So again, the, when coach Lambert talked to me about, Hey, this is what you got to do, Chip. You know, you need to, you know, try to get a GA, you know, try to get a GA graduate assistant position where, you know, at, at some bigger schools, you're not coaching, but you're helping the full-time coaches at some smaller schools division at some smaller schools, GAs, you know, will, will, will coach a position. It's a true story. They used to have a, they used to have a book that was a super thick black book with every college in, um, they don't even have it anymore. Every college in the, in the, in the United States, I can remember graduating and emailing every college from A all the way to Z, you know, email, apply, um, send a hard copy. And I can remember, I still think I probably got some, a lot of the ding letters back, you know, maybe from Dartmouth or whatever, Cornell or whatever, school, mm-hmm. probably Bucknell as well. And all the schools, Missouri, you know, and you now, you know, we're not interested. I'll never forget. I'm at my house in, in, it had to be February. My dad and I were getting ready to go to a Sixers game, a big Sixers fan, big Eagles and Sixers, right? We're getting ready to go to the game. The telephone rings. This is before land. This is before cell phones. The landline rings. I remember getting ready, walking out the door and the, and the phone rang. I'm like, should I get that? Run back in, get it. Hi, Chip. This is Tom Horn, the head coach from Valparaiso. I said, oh. <laughs> so usually you get into coaching by somebody knowing you and, you know, you, um, you know, you get recommended. And, but that wasn't the case. So, he, you know, he had he needed a guy. And I remember he, they flew me out to Gary, Indiana. Uh, he, <laughs> Gary, Indiana is about 50 minutes from Valpo. So he drives up in his Camaro, picks me up. I drive down, I, 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 I sit down with him briefly. I meet with all the receivers. He put mm-hmm. me through a, a meeting, which I thought was pretty slick. I'm 23 years old now, so I had to go in there and, you know, p- c- command the room at 23. I remember meeting yeah. with the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, special teams coach, and then getting back on a plane that next – I think I got on a plane either that day or the next – no, I didn't even stay. I got on a plane the next – the same night. Flew back, and a couple weeks later, you know, um, I ended up getting a job and driving out for spring practice – March of two thousand and three. March of two thousand and three. So that's how now, I got to Valpo. What's the what's the mentality like when you're you're twenty three years old? You just had the pads on a year earlier. What's it like now coaching young men that were just playing that same sport that you were a, an athlete in? Now you're on the other side. Yeah it it was good because. And I'm, I want to be careful how I say this because you know because there's a lot of coaches in the NFL who haven't played that are really good coaches. Mm-hmm. But me coming from you know a one double A um, scholarship school, um, going into Valpo, which was a one double A non scholarship school, it, it, I had instant credibility going in there. You know, I'd always been good with building relationships, communicating. Um, those were two of my strengths. So being 23 years old and running the, like, and that's what I was saying when you've G at like Minnesota or Rutgers or Penn State. You know, you're getting coffee, you know, you're helping with the scout book, whatever a coach needs. But when you G at, and I'm blessed and fortunate, when you G at a place like Valparaiso, like I was, I, had, I was coaching the wide receivers. Like mm-hmm. that guy right, that guy right there that's running with that football was one of my guy, Rob Giacola. Like that was my player, like that I coached that year. So it was really, it was really cool. It had to be very professional. Like, you know, as 23 years old, you know, right, we're on a podcast, you know, there's Valpo's not a big place. There's certain bars that the players went to. Well, I couldn't go to the bars the players went to and then try to, um, you know, demand something from them on a Tuesday. So mm-hmm. we let, let those guys go do their thing. And, you know, we had our own spot that we went to. So it was it, it forced me to, to, to learn the profession really fast on relationships, how to talk to young people um, and just how to motivate. It was it was a good experience. It was. And then what talk to us a little bit about the the NFL, the summer internships, because I know that's a that is a program the NFL has been running for a while now. Um, and, and from what I saw, you, you were really, you had a bunch of teams that you had gotten an opportunity to work with. What was that experience like? Well, first of all, it was amazing. Um, it, you can watch a game on a Sunday 
and or go to a game on a on a on a on a Sunday and just watch and you're like man those guys are superhuman you know like what do they need coaches for but the thing that I learned and you know when I did it in 2008 um with the Cardinals like Larry Fitzgerald, Anquan Bolden, Edron James, Kurt Warner, those guys wanted to get coached. So mm-hmm. I'm 28 years old. I'm 28 years old in that program. And what that helped me, what that helped me do is I said, I can all, we can demand that our players want to be better and want to get coached. When you see Larry Fitzgerald uh, at that time, maybe a, a six, he was in the league, maybe six or seven years, all pro. He's sitting in a meeting with a notepad and he's like, all right, receivers coach, you know, get me better. I was like, wow, man, that was pretty cool and eye opening for me. And then, um, and then, you know, you just with the in, in coaching and any profession, it's just relationships. So Todd Haley was the offensive coordinator in 2008 with the Cardinals. And then he gets the head coaching job with the Chiefs the next year. Mm-hmm. Takes a couple of coaches that I stayed very close to to today. Mo Carthan is a, is a mentor of mine. And he was like, hey, Chip, we got a chance for you to do the internship again. And, you know, just be around pros and see how pros act and see how pro practices really work. So now I'm 29 years old doing that. And um that was that was awesome again and then I just ended up going out to Pittsburgh um this past May um just because again at, now I'm a little bit older right so at that point I was a position coach I wasn't even a coordinator yet so I'm mm-hmm. a position coach so you just run your own room well now I've developed I'm in a I've, I've been in a head coaching role and that program like you said you're right it has been going on there was only one team I wanted to go see there was one head coach that I needed to go see and be around for the time frame I was Mike Tomlin and Mike team. There, there is nothing mystical about why that, that program is good, why they win, why they develop people. He is, he's, he's, he's awesome. And I, I can't say anything. I was, I was I almost a little starstruck when I first met him. I said, that's Mike Tomlin. And he just, <laughs> he, he, he opened his arms up, embraced me. And, you know, they let me, you know, I was working with the running backs actually the, the whole week and it was, it was a good experience. So, I mean, and everybody doesn't get a chance to do it. So I've, I've, I've been fortunate to be around three NFL teams. So. Well, I know I know you're an Eagles fan, but as a Steeler fan, that makes me real happy to hear that that, that <laughs> you guys yep. you guys might be the the winning program on the on, on in the state right now. But right. you know, there's right. still that organization on the other side. It's a um, big but. It's a big but. Absolutely. <laughs> um. So it's interesting you brought up. Well, first we'll go back. So you go from Valpo to <coughs> Rose Holman. Yep. And then from there, you go back to Valpo, and this is where the you start to kind of get into your offensive coordinator, your QB coaching. Yep. What was the second stint at Valpo like? Yeah, so not to not to um, jump over, it was really interesting. So in 2003 and four, I'm coaching the wide receivers as a GA, going to college, getting my grad degree, doing that. I get my first full-time job at Rose Holman in 05. Mm-hmm. I never forget, I get that. It's in Terre Haute, two hours south of Valpo. I get down there. In, in May, because I graduated. Yeah, I get down there in May or June. There's a coaching change at Valpo. The offensive coordinator becomes, so the guy I was working really close with, Coach Adams to this day, another mentor I still talk to, he becomes the head coach. So at 20, yeah, at 24, at 25 years old, he's like, Chip, I need you to come back. Well, it's July. So I'm like, man, I can't leave Rose Holman right now. Like, I, I, I just knew that was wrong. And ethically, it wasn't, it wasn't right. So I mm-hmm. told him, I said, Coach A, I can't do that. You know, and to this day, the head coach, Ted Karras, who gave me my first head, my first job, who's the head coach at Marion, who they're actually in the playoffs. He's to this day. We always talk about that. And I've always I've always had a there's a loyalty there that he respects. So I'm glad I made that decision. But we go through the whole season at Rolls Holman. Um, and the guy that coach a hired, it didn't work out. So when the season was over, that's when I got back um, to Valpo and I actually got a chance to coach defense there. I was the DB's coach from 06 to 08 coaching the special teams and DBs. And then after I did the internship with the chiefs, you know, coach a, I'd been kind of bugging him. Hey, I want to coach quarterbacks. I mean, I want to coach quarterbacks and gave me opportunity to coach the quarterbacks and be the co-offensive coordinator. It didn't go the way we wanted it to go. We had a lot of injuries um, that year, but again, you know what? I had the opportunity to do it. Um, so it, it, was, it was good. So that's kind of like how we got to, to the end of the Valpo era. And then, you know, full circle moment a little bit, because when you were talking earlier, when you gave your answer about, you know, going through the coaching carousel and remembering, you know, the Bucknells and the Cor- and Cornell and Dartmouth and whatnot, yeah. you then get to spend three years at Bucknell. And what was that experience like? That was football school. I mean, that was football school, man. And we should probably talk about how I got the job. Like, so we get we get fired from, from Valpo. Mm-hmm. happens in the profession you know we get fired and and i remember you know the head, the head coach got let go thanksgiving we recruited our tails off and again right 
you, that could have went a lot of different ways. I could have been, I'm looking for another job. Um, but I kept my feet down on the ground and said, you know what? Now I'm going to recruit, bust my, th- I remember going to schools in Chicago and they're like, y'all ain't got no head coach, but I was still out there. I had two kids signed before um, the new head coach came in. New head coach comes in, gives me five minutes. Like, Hey, why should I keep you? <laughs> I tell him all this stuff, <laughs> you know? And he was like, eh, it's not going to work out. And, uh, um, so, you know, January 24th, you know, it was my last day. I never forget it. January 24th, 2010 was my last day at, at Valpo. By February 8th, I had a job at Bucknell, man. It was, and we'll talk about that story here in a minute, but that's how, that's how that kind of happened, man. So, um, so just really to fast forward, right. All about connections, how mm-hmm. you represent yourself, how you carry yourself. Right. So our high school AD athletic director was very connected in Jersey, super connected. <sighs> this story amazes me every time I tell her, I think about it. Cause it's about, you never know what, what's going on. I get, we get fired. Hey, coach Riley, like, just so you know, Hey, I'm a free agent. Um, I don't have a job, yada, yada, yada. A couple of days go by. He said, Chip, you need to get your stuff to Bucknell right now. Okay. So the head, the, the assistant head coach at uh, Rutgers at the time, Joe Susan, again, taught me a lot. Uh, we'll talk about that here when we talk about the Bucknell era, but talking about how we got there, Joe Susan was an assistant at Rutgers, gets the head coaching job at Bucknell. Mm-hmm. Coach Riley's daughters worked in the offices at Rutgers, so they had a really good relationship. Coach Riley knew Coach Susan well. They knew each other. Coach Riley picks up the phone and says, you need to hire Chip Taylor. I talked to Coach Susan once on the phone. He's a Jersey guy, right? He's a North Jersey guy. I'm a South Jersey guy, so there's a connection. I talked to him once. He was actually pretty impressed about the NFL internships. He was really – he actually talked about that more than anything. Mm -hmm. Um, I talked to the the defensive coordinator twice, Clayton Carlin, who's a defensive coordinator at Sam Houston now, who I respect and learn so much from. Talked to him twice. Him and Coach Riley knew each other. And then – February uh, February eighth, I mean, February tenth. I'm driving out to I'm driving out to Bucknell for spring practice. <laughs> now, what was that first year like? Because that has uh, to be you're you're probably driving up there like, yeah, here we go. We're we're right back in the seat. Oh, hey man, listen, I messed everything up, man. It was so bad. I shouldn't say it was so bad, but coming from Coach Adams, who let me grow, um, developed me, going to. And again, this is nothing bad. This is nothing terrible because every coach has a different style. My style mm-hmm. is a little different too, but Coach Susan came from Greg Schiano's tree. Greg Schiano and P.J. Fleck, they're all from that same tree. So Greg Schiano, P.J. Fleck, Joe Susan, they all were together. Very demanding. Um, you better make sure you, you got an answer for when something comes up and you better stay ahead of things and you need to keep stuff off the head coach's desk. So when I say football school, it really, it actually probably prepared me for this job, but I really learned the, the business at Bucknell, like it was like stay your lane, coach DBs in the special teams. Don't worry about nothing else and bring in recruits, recruit, 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 you know, and I had South Jersey and it was, and it was awesome. So um, that was, a, it was an interesting experience. Now we went one in 10, we were playing a freshman quarterback and that was tough. Um, but, you know, it was, we, we, we made it through together with a great staff there. And, you know, we had to kind of stick together because it was, it would be hard on a Sunday after, after those losses when coach Susan is asking you, why is the corner uh, not whatever, not at seven yards on it? It was just, it was awesome. It was a good experience. And then, so from, from year one to year three, what was the biggest change for you? Mm, great question. Great question. Yeah, you're probably not going to like this answer, uh, but <laughs> players, that kid right there, Bryce Robertson, yeah. <laughs> that guy led the country as a senior in interceptions. So... You know, and we had him on the team in 2010, but in 2011, the light switch kind of clicked. And we mm-hmm. always played good defense at Bucknell, but, I mean, he was just a takeaway monster. Now, it wasn't all him. We had some guys up front that put – and, again, football is complimentary, right? If you got guys up front that can get to the quarterback, quarterback's going to throw the ball up, and he put himself in great position. So, you know, we ended up 6-5 and five in 2011. We led, the, we led the nation in turnovers. He led the country in interceptions. I mean, it was just a – it was a fun year, man. It was, it was, that was a fun year. Mm-hmm. Um, so – and then you and a uh, a partner, I believe, from that staff at Bucknell yep. end up where you are now in 2013, and yep. you end up over there as the, the DC? Yes, sir. So Again. why was Hamlin – because like, like you said, I, I've been kind of doing my research trying to – I'm learning about, about the MEAC and, and the schools yep. that are in it. Yep. How did you find Hamlin, and why was that the right fit for your career? Yeah. Wow. Um, so, so fortunate with this one. And this is, this is, and I'm a big believer, even today when I talk to my players and, and even young coaches um, about timing, 
Mm-hmm. Chad Rogaszewski, we were on the first staff at Bucknell to go. So he gets hired in 2010, January, I get hired. I was like the last hire in February, 2010. We sit next to each other every day in staff meeting. So when the head coach is chewing him out, I'm looking at him like, <laughs> when the head coach is chewing me out, he's looking at me like, yo, hang in there. Like, so <laughs> the point is he interviewed for the Hamlin job in 2010. He did not get it. And if he would have got that job, I probably, my, I don't know where my career would have been. I probably would be, I wouldn't be, I'd hopefully still be coaching, but I wouldn't have been here because mm-hmm. we didn't develop that relationship yet. So 2011 goes through, you know, we go through the fires. We're getting closer. 2000, he, he coached the O-line, but we sat next to each other for three years, right? So 2012 comes and he entered the job open, the Hamlin, the Hamlin job opened up. And I probably, I probably, I should say he was from Minnesota and he was an alum of Hamlin. Okay. So when, so when he got the job, i never forget is December of 2012. We're sitting in the back room at some little lounge because we have recruits on campus. Um, he's like, Chip, I think I got this job. Would you be interested in coming out and being the defensive coordinator? And I'm like, at that point, you know, I've done a couple NFL internships. You know, I, I interviewed for like the William Mary job. I tried to get on at Northern Iowa, you know, try to make the stepping stone up the ladder a little bit. And mm-hmm. I said, you know what, man, at this point, I, I care about working with good people. And I knew Chad was a good dude, man. So I, he got the job. And I never forget again in February. So he gets a job December. He did a great job of recruiting all the way. Cause I didn't get here until February 8th of 2013, 2013 was my first year. So mm-hmm. I didn't get here till uh, 2013. And he basically had a whole class ready to go. And for me professionally, I had never, co- I had never called the defense. We played good defense at Bucknell and I, he wanted to, he wanted to do what we did at Bucknell. So mm-hmm. it was awesome for me to really, it accelerated my learning curve. I had to learn the front. Obviously, I was always a back end guy, but just knowing what we wanted to do up front and how we wanted to play it. So he gave me a great opportunity. Again, I talk, still talk to him to this day. Man. So I'm very appreciative of Coach Susan, Chad Rogaszewski, Stacey Adams, Ted Karras. Like, very appreciative of those guys and the development of my career. So, well, so let's let's talk about you as as a head coach now. Um, sure. Philosophy wise, in 2013, where is your coaching philosophy as opposed to where it is today? Yeah, well, so, well, 2013, I was coaching the defense. So 13, 14, 15, that's all I had to worry about, right? Just wanted to be, um, again, always want to teach and demand, mm-hmm. right? Want to teach and demand and be clear in communication. Those are things that are always going to be important to me. Uh, we got to demand that they do things the right way. We got to teach. And how we talk to them is very important. I don't like to be condescending. Um, you know, don't, do we curse at times? Yes, but. You know, I always, my biggest thing is how would you want, even when I was a coordinator, even when I was a position coach, would I want my son to play for me or would I want somebody else's kid to play for me? So that was always very, very, very important to me on how we talk and how we treat our players. Um, so in 2013, 14, 15, just worried about the defense. When I got the opportunity to be the head coach, again, just kind of kept my same core values, man. Teach, teach and demand, um, communicate, and motivate. Like those are, those are my core values with, 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 with coaching as a head football coach and, it's crazy now because I'm the old guy in the room, right? I look around at my staff and we're very young. So there's, I have to be, I have to kind of recreate myself to kind of help those guys and develop them like people developed me. So Now, coach, what led to the coaching change after the three yeah. years as the D coordinator? Sure. Um, coach Rogo, gosh, and I was just actually, I had a meeting with my AD yesterday and it came up. I said, man, I wonder if coach Rogo would have stayed, you know, where would this program be? Cause we had things rolling. We were two and eight, four and six, four and six. And in my first year as a head coach, we went five and five, but he had another opportunity to go uh, turn a program around at Capitol University um, okay. out in Ohio. Um, so he, and so another D3. So he left Hamlin to go to Ohio um, and he wanted me to come with him. But I was like, if I'm ever going to be a head coach, you know, this is probably, this is, this is where it's going to happen, you know? So, so I stayed and I was, I was fortunate enough to, to get the job. So now let's put us in the room. You're, sure. I'm, uh, you're recruiting me. My parents are here. What What's that conversation go like? Obviously, the guy got to be able to play football, but yep. what's the conversation? What are you looking for in a student athlete? <clears throat> There's a lot of times when and when they're sitting in my office, I'm not even talking about football. You know, I'm really talking about life, mm-hmm. right? And that's the one thing where when you see guys leave the program or guys come in the program, I know for a fact how you're going to get treated here. Like, we're going to pour into you and – Yes, it's about winning football games. Yes, I've been fired before. I know performance matters. But are we pouring into you? Are we developing you into a, a young person and a young man? That is so important to me. And people ask me, what's the best part of coaching college football? It's when I see those guys, when we see them 
come into the program, they work the program, the light switch comes on and they can understand they can function in the real world afterwards. When my guys come back to the hammer game against McAllister and they're fired up that we win and I see that they're doing well or they send me pictures of their, their wives and their babies. Like it's just, to, to me, that's the biggest thing. So development of, of them as, as people and, and and players too. You know, you, it's good when you can take a player and you know maybe he can't get out of his back pedal right. And then the one time he does it, oh, the light switch came on. Now he's flourishing in the defense. So I would say those are some of the things I'm, I'm really talking about, but not a lot of football. It's more so we're going to take care of your son. We're going to love him, feed him, coach him up hard. Um, and just make sure that they have the tools that when they graduate, they're not living in your basement, they're out on their own. So. <laughs> Listen, my dad would have loved you because that was what he told me when I graduated. You're, you're graduated now. Don't come home. You, you go be an adult now. Exactly. Um, so coach, what, uh, talk to us a little bit about Hamlin. Just give us the, yes. give us the, tell us about the college or the yep. university. Tell us about the, the community. Yep. What, what, yep. what makes Hamlin special? Yeah. I, I, man. I tell you what, that's a that's a that's a loaded question, man. To me, why I've stayed here so long and why what I've been attracted to is the people. You know, like I have a unique relationship with the president too. Like I can go in her office and and she supports us. And but the professors, the people around the staff, like they genuinely care about these 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 young people that are in the school, man. It's about uh, 18, 1900 students. Um, we're located in St. Paul. Um, you know, it's a little bit more of a little bit more urban area, but the thing about it is once you get on campus, you can't even tell you're in the city. That's why when we get parents and families on campus, especially from distance, or there's been some families from say the West Metro or the East Metro, they say, wow, we've driven past here, but we've never been on campus. It blows their socks off. I'm not going to say we have the, the best facilities, but I mean, we have what we need to be successful. And, you know, we just have a, a really good thing going here. Now I'll say it's there's school and you talked about the mic and I'm sure we'll touch. There's some schools that, have some really really shiny things and and it makes it a little bit of a challenge but i've always been an underdog and i like challenges i like being able to say man how do we get this program really thriving to a spot where like a you know like a augsburg or Gus davis because that's the next step for us you know bethel and st john's and concordia cobbers they got a lot of history they're they're out there we're chasing them schools but the ones that are in our reach right now is like the augsburg and, and the Gus davis how do we get there so that's that was that's what makes the challenge good every day waking up and going to work so well, and, and so last year was it the 2022 season? I should say sure. that so that yep. so that we're the 2022 season. You guys go two and eight this year, yep. four and six. So that yep. there, there's a there's steady improvement there. What yep. was the biggest? What was the noticeable improvement from last year's group to this year's group? I would say two things. I, I will shine a light on. I had a coach, and I this is I had never had done this before, but I I guess you could say a leadership coach. Mm -hmm. And he really took the reins in January of this last year. No, with this yeah, January of this year, meeting with you know we identified twelve guys, and every Tuesday morning um, after lifts, man, those dudes were in there. Meet, I was in there too, but he kind of led it, and we mm -hmm. just talked about things about being mindful and you know how we you know from coach to coach, player to coach, uh, player to player, um, player to coach, like how we talk to each other, you know how we pour into each other. So I think that had a lot to do with it, man, because the, uh, the, that's one piece of it. I um, mean, and the second piece of it is we had a dog on, we had a dog at receiver. I mean, we had a guy, we had a guy, Charlie Wilson, that was a really, really good football player. We had a very, um, uh, very solid quarterback who can still grow and get better. You know, our offensive line play has got, we've gotten bigger um, mm -hmm. and we're going to continue to get better, but we had some, we had some pieces on offense and we had a couple backs that were really nice. And so, and then, you know, it was, and I had to make some staff changes. I'm talking about like myself, I was calling the defense in 2022 and, you know, the time and effort that it takes to do that, I had, I had identified that I can't, I'm not giving these guys what they need, man. I need to be able to manage the whole program. So, you know, elevate a couple guys to coordinate. They did a good job. And we had a new coordinator this year and, you know, I'm working with him, but he did a good job of getting the ball to Charlie Wilson. And so that was the, that, I would say those two things were the biggest change, the leadership, um, the leadership group. And then, you know, we had a couple, we had a couple nice pieces. So. Well, let's, while we're, while we're on the subject of this season and, and you brought, we both brought up the, the conference, the MEAC, Mm -hmm. um, what is it about the MEAC? We talked on the uh, before we started recording. We talked about how for continuous years, you got your conference specifically has put multiple teams in the tournament. So there's clearly sure. you and that other EAC, the WEAC. You guys yeah. seem to put a lot of schools into yeah. the tournament real fast. Cool. Um, so what is it about the MEAC, and and how does that? 
how does how do you struggle are there struggles i guess in the recruiting process because you're going up yes. against those other schools well to kind of answer your question first when I, when i came from bucknell to hamlin <laughs> like st thomas was in the league st john's was in the league i mean gus davis beat us up pretty bad the first year augsburg had a court had they had a dog at quarterback mm-hmm. concordia was t- like i was very impressed with the players that were in this league and for, for being division three and the coaching in this league I thought those two things, I was like, wow, we left the Patriot League. Chad and I left the Patriot League to come, you know, one double A to come here. And I was very impressed. I was like, there's a lot of guys that can play at that level. And um, I thought the coaching was really, really good. So, you know, I think in the second part of your question, you know, traditionally there's been some teams that's really been good, man. Like, you know, I know the guy at Co- uh, at Bethel, Coach Johnson, whenever I see him, he always says, Chip, back in, he's been there 30 years now. Chip, when I, back in the 80s, we wanted to be like Hamlin. And they, you know, they grinded with it and stuck with it. And now they're upper echelon teams. And that took time. You know, St. Mm-hmm. John's is St. John's. Like, I knew who St. John's was when I lived in New Jersey. Like, it was like that that school out there in Minnesota, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's just, there's some challenges. But, again, I look at it like the Big Ten. You look at, a, um, you know, Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State. Then you look at Rutgers, Minnesota. Uh, I, I can't say Iowa because Iowa's a championship. But, like, you know, Northwestern, Illinois, yeah. they're going to – Nebraska, you got to grind it out. You got to find a way. You got to, you know, nobody cares. You got to find a way to, to get yourself playing at the best level um, you can and, and then find a way to grind out a win or two that you probably shouldn't win. So, and then what, fill me in. What are the recruitment areas that you look at? Yeah. Obviously, Minnesota, but what, where else are you looking? Yes. Um, so we, we do, a, we, we try to do a good job in state. All right. And that's a little bit of a challenge too, right? Because if you are a, possibly could play division two but division three player that's that's pretty doggone good you know they're not looking at hamlin first for the mm-hmm. most part right now if i get a relationship with a kid in the summer or a staff gets a relationship with a kid in the summer which we have and gotten like charlie wilson right um you, you can get a couple of those guys so we do we try to do a good job of getting um the kids that fit that are from minnesota to hamlin but then right now you know my one of my defensive coordinators he just landed in arizona that's been a good state for us um, my offensive line coach is a former NFL um, player. Mike Harris is from Cali, played at UCLA um, and is from California. He's flying out to California, uh, not this Monday, but the next Monday. And then we have our, our offensive coordinator. Colorado has been a solid state for us. So he'll fly out to Colorado in, in January. Wow. So those three states, those three states have been good for us. We spot recruited Texas. We've got one, two, three. We got, we got three or four. We got three players from Texas on our team, but the majority of our team is Minnesota, a little Wisconsin, one from Iowa, but then we'll get, you know, I think we got 10 on our roster from Colorado right now. So, and then, so walk me through what a uh, typical practice is. So I talked to coach fashing is the first yep. coach. And, and, you know, I, it, it blew my mind that the no shoulder pads thing that I remembered, they've always done the no shoulder it's, pads thing. It's been, so walk us through a day yep. in your guys's practice and then, and maybe a pregame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and again, man, they took my hats off. I got to tip my hat to that guy. He does a great job up there, man. Just what they do and the production of it, it's it's awesome, man. We're, we're definitely chasing those guys. But typical practice, obviously, we'll start with a team meeting at 2.30. I'll address the team, you know, whatever we got to get done, um, you know, housekeeping-wise, uh, messaging for the week, um, usually on a Tuesday. Mm-hmm. Special team meeting at t- special team meeting at uh, 2.40. They'll take us right up to position meetings. Position meetings at 3 o'clock. Those will run till about 3.40, 3.45, depending on what we got to get done install-wise. Uh, we'll be out on the field at 4.15. Um, what I like to always do, just from a progression standpoint, is, you know, we're always going to do a walkthrough first. So whatever we just installed at two at 3 o'clock, we're going to walk through it first and make sure all everything is tightened up and buttoned up, okay? Then we're going to stretch. Uh, we're going to get into some of what we call specialists, where the, uh, the, the, the long snappers, short snappers, kickers, punters, holders, um, returners, they're going to get mm-hmm. their work in. And then we'll have the other guys doing, like the offensive line is doing their thing. Uh, receivers, uh, running backs are doing their thing. Um, and then we get into individual. You know, and as the season is early, you get about, I'll give those guys anywhere from 40 minutes to 30 minutes of indie time where they can work different techniques, stance and start, you know, where are your eyes, hand placement, first step, um, um, things like that and in individual um, and then as the season goes, you know, you cut individual down because, you know, obviously you lose light and, you know, you got to take care of these guys' bodies. So after you go from individual, the first competition thing that we do, um, and again, 
probably giving a lot of information, but it's okay. It's a great podcast. I stole it from the Steelers. So they do something where, you know, they get in the red zone and, and they're doing their work, you know, so that, that's the first competition that they do. And that's the first competition that we did every, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, again, offense, good versus good. Um, and, you know, it, it was good for us red zone defense wise. And it's good for us red mm -hmm. zone offense wise that, Hey, we get in the red zone. We know what coach Shelby's calling offensively. Hey, we get in the red zone. We know what our defensive coordinators are calling. So it was, that was really good for us. We'll get us, we'll hit a couple special teams and then we'll get into, you know, um, okay, we're playing crown this week. Okay. What's crown's defense do you guys go down there and um, you guys uh, show crown's defense and offensively you run against it. Okay. What does crown's offense do? You guys go down there, crown's offense, and then put a defense against it. And then um, we'll do that a couple times, another special team, and then we're pretty much out of there. So Now, I got to ask this question from, from your standpoint. How much yeah. has practice changed from playing days to now 2023 here in coaching? It's it's changed a lot. <laughs> I, I, I We joke with – we're on a group chat with my teammates and – you know, they kind of asked me, what's pra they asked saying, what's practice like? And it's nothing like what we went through. I mean, those, God bless those coaches. And, and times are different. Times yeah. are different. And I mean, they, I, I don't want to make this sound bad, but we, <laughs> but Coach Barry's, Coach Barry's philosophy, we want to be, the, we want to be physical and fast. So in order to be physical, we tackled every Tuesday. And <laughs> those, <laughs> those were some, those were some brutal things, man. And you know what, actually this training camp, this was the first training camp as a head coach. And again, coach, Fa coach fashion is a little bit different, but we, and I was so scared to do it because you don't want to lose a kid, but we tackled in training camp. Like I said, Nope, we're rolling. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to get our work in. We're going to tackle. And that's how I remember practices back in 1998, 99, 2000. Yeah, we're going to get after it, but um, you know, we got a philosophy. You have to change a little bit. You got to take care of these guys. And um, you know, things are just, you know, things are just different these days. So. And then my other question for you on that, yep. in that same breath, how, how much has the game itself changed to, to need that philosophy change and kind of growing with the times? Because like, yeah. I know that the rules are a little different now too, right? There's not, sure. you don't have as much time to be on the field. Correct. I would say how the, how it's changed, even just thinking back from, from, from my playing days, it was a lot more, Two back football, run it down your throat. Yep. Um, load the box up defensively. Stop the run. Teams weren't teams weren't teams weren't the RPO run pass option wasn't a thing back in no. our day. So it was either run or pass. So that's what you got. Yeah, there defend, was no right. right? There, that was it. Now the game has changed so much. Where now what offenses are doing is they're putting a few defensive players in conflict. So okay, you want to play the run. We're going to throw it. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want to play the pass? We're going to run it. And that wasn't a thing. So it, it's changed. That's changed the game a lot. I mean, I remember the first time I saw one of those things, I'm watching in film and I said, wait a minute, go back. What just happened there? So what did he just do? Why, why did he hand the ball off there? Like I thought it was a pass play. Well, coach, we were reading this. Oh, <laughs> interesting. So yeah, man, the game's changed. <laughs> now coach, you played one double a ball. You played, yep. you coached at one double a. Yep. What, is the big and I've asked a bunch of coaches this. I kind of yep. I catch flack every time I ask this question. What's the biggest difference between Division One and the yep. athletes that you're coaching at Division Three? Yeah, um, that's man. Because I haven't like I'm trying to think back to 2010, 11, 12. I just you know the guys at that level, man, they're just probably a little bit more twitchier. Um, can get it can get in and out of their breaks a little bit faster. I'm talking about from the skill position. And mm -hmm. offensively, man, like just the offensive lines are just bigger and they're stronger. Defensive lines, the, the guys are active. Like I said, when that kid Bryce Robertson had 13 interceptions in 20, in 2011, we had two defensive linemen that could not be blocked. Yeah, like you know, and they were playing against one double eight offensive linemen, and we were running through those guys. So I would just say the you know this. I, I want to be careful with the size because you look at St. John's offensive line and you look at Bethel's offensive line; they look like one double A lines. Yeah, but it's just a, it's a, the strength, the strength and the movement, I think is the, is a difference. Um, so that works. That works for me. I, I understand where you're, you're trying, you're not, it's not an insult to the players. It's just oh, no. a, it's Definitely. just a difference in a half a second out of your stance or maybe a half an inch taller or a couple yeah. pounds heavier, pretty much. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that, that's it. But I, again, I want to be careful. Bethel shucks, Concordia and St. John's, they have some dudes now, 
they got some guys that look the part that you can maybe be at uh, whatever, a Northern Iowa or North Dakota State. But again, it's just a little bit different. It's just a little bit different at that level. So, All right, Coach, we're, we're at my favorite point of the show. It's the five questions they have nothing to do with football. They're just about you. Oh, and then if you would like to ask any questions for of me, I will I will be because I grilled you, so it, it's totally right. Um, so here's the first question: If you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be and why? Oh man, if I could live in that is tough. If I could live anywhere anywhere in the world, not the United States, I would probably say, man, I know people are going to be like, huh? I'd probably say Nashville. Okay. I like that. I like Nashville, man. Cause I love live music. There, you could walk into any place, and you got some guy or some lady in the corner singing, trying to trying to get try to be the next person at the CMA at the CMA Awards. So I'd probably say Nashville, um, just from a standpoint of where we're centrally located in the country, the music, the food. I, I like Nashville. I could I could see myself there. I have never been, but I've heard it's a it's a phenomenal time. So it's on my list. My fiance wants to go there. Oh, I, I'm nice. sure I'm going to catch flack for pointing it out. But <laughs> um, what's the most important lesson that you've learned over your career? <clears throat> most important lesson I've learned, um, man, just just making sure that the the the, the it, it's not about you. It's not about, you know, it's not about me. It's about, it's about those players. That's, it's, that's what it's about, man. Like if you can pour into those guys, I have guys that'll text me out the blue. Hey coach, remember you said this? And I'm like, nope, I sure don't. But it had an <laughs> impact on those guys. And so that would say, just making it about the players, just, just trying to make it about the players. That's the biggest, biggest lesson I've learned. If you weren't coaching, what would you be doing and why? Wow, what would I what 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 do I think I'd be doing or what would I want to do? Uh, either one, you can answer both. What what I'd probably be doing is 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 teaching. I'd probably be, I'd be teaching. I'd be in a high school somewhere teaching, trying to have an impact on young people's lives. Um, what I want to do, wow, I mean, I and but either between doing something in NASCAR or doing something with like uh, Delta flying planes or something like that. Those two, wow. would, I think those would be two cool professions. That's for, see, I, I've never flown. But I have been to a NASCAR event, so that I could see where oh, that would be a good time. I've been to three of them, man. It's been awesome. They have been – it's cool. It is cool. All right, this is a two-parter. Best compliment you've ever received? Best compliment? Um, wow. Just – just uh, I'd probably say how – how, and I'm talking about just – I just got a letter from a player who just graduated. Just probably how I've treated people. That's best – and that's pretty cool. You know, how you treat people matters. Mm -hmm. Um. Even when things aren't going well, I can remember that, you know, we went to, we, we won the first two games in 2022 and then we lost eight straight and tried to just be the same person, you know, cause that was hard to try yeah. to be the same person, not taking out on the players cause they're not out there trying to mess it up, you know? So just making sure we, we keep it about us as coaches. Hey, let's make sure we put these dudes in the right spot and then continue to keep treating these, these, these young people the right way. So probably just, you know, just how I've treated people. And then the other side of compliments, what's the best insult you've ever received? <laughs> probably too nice <laughs> nice <laughs> i like that i like that that's that could be a compliment or an insult really <laughs> too nice man. um and then the last question i've asked every coach it's uh it's worded funky hopefully next season i'll figure out a way to word it better but was there a question that you were expecting and if so how would you have answered it is there a question i was expecting no, no, I think, I mean, I've done enough of these things where I kind of feel like you hit everything. You know, I think you hit everything. You went from the past all the way to how we got here and about Hamlin and recruiting. I mean, I, yeah, I think you hit everything. Yep. And then lastly, because I'm going to, I forgot to do it when, before we finished up the football, what's the message for 2024? I know it's early. We're getting it. We're just rolling into the off season, but what's yeah. the message going into 2024? Yeah, we, you know, Again, I want to be very careful because, you know, I, um, we did a good job of, you know, just being very mindful last year. But, you know, just it's a little bit more so under the, the mindset. We got, you know, something to prove. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a great league, man. I mean, you talk about McAllister, that's going to be a dog fight. Augsburg, that's another a dog fight. Gustavus beat St. John's. You know, we don't play St. John's next year, but Concordia and, and Bethel, they're all tough. Man. So we got something to prove. Carlton, 
right? Carlton's another team I haven't even talked about. They took a step. I remember when I first got here in 2013, they weren't what they were, and they have put themselves in that that group of Augsburg, Gus Davis, Carlton. So it's got something to prove, man. We got we to gotta be really good this offseason. We got to be ready to roll. So, Well, Coach, I really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very and, much. Uh, Thank you. We're gonna. We're definitely gonna keep in touch. We're definitely gonna keep an eye on what's going on with Hamlin University as it as we go through the twenty twenty four season. Um, and who knows? There's a there's a couple other things in the works. So you might be getting an email from me to do a oh. different type of this. So sounds good. I re- like again, like I said in the beginning, two things. Thank you for reaching out, and thank you for everybody who's gonna who's gonna watch this. So, and I agree with him. Thank you to everybody that that's going to watch this. If you if you know something that I missed and you want to ask, Coach. Leave a comment. I'm sure he'll be willing, more than willing to see it if he sees it and he'll respond. Uh, for those of you sticking around, we are heading into our final four for the picks. I'm sure Serenity's got a little, she's a little anxious to find out how last how she did last week. Uh, but we will be right back with overtime. I am Carla Guadagnino, Coach Taylor of Hamlin University, and we'll be right back, Chuckleheads. What's going on, Chuckleheads? I am Carla Guadagnino. This is Overtime with Serenity Brown. That's Serenity Brown. Um, before we go any further, I'm just going to say she went three and one, DB went two and two, and I went the opposite of her. Uh, so it was a very rough week for me on the picks. Um, there's two games being played, four teams left. We're in the final four. Just finished up with, uh, coach Taylor with Hamlin. Uh, really appreciate him taking the time to come on and talk to us. He'll talk to me. And uh, just some of the stories that he told and his, you can kind of, you get the passion kind of jumps off of like when he talks about football and he talks about what the program can be and where they want to get to. Um, That being said, if you're watching us on YouTube, listen to us and watching us on Spotify, really appreciate you. Tell a friend to tell a friend, make sure you join the conversation on social media. It's Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. The only one that's different is the Instagram page, which is dingo underscore talk. This week's games. Portland travels to Randolph-Macon as a group. We're riding with the Yellow Jackets. First time into the Final Four. I think they're they're bound for Salem, Virginia. Um, Although, I will say this. Portland went out. A lot of people questioned whether they could uh, put up points, especially after Alma went into Matt Mount Union and and knocked Mount Union off. Yeah, Alma disappointed me, so. You know, uh, Cortland went out there and, and on, in game. all aspects of the game. I mean, they they were run, they ran the ball well. They threw the ball well. They converted on third downs. Uh, they the and their defense came up with stops. Uh, on the other side, um, I think everybody that watched lacrosse versus North Central can say uh, North Central gave or well, was given probably the closest game that they, I think it's. I think somebody put out the stat that was the first time and. All season, they gave up 40 points. Um, so, lacrosse and um, North Central was definitely one of the games. Randolph Macon and John Carroll had them, or John Hopkins had themselves one hell of a game. Randolph Macon ended up winning, ends up winning on a uh, last second field goal. And then Wartburg was the home team, went down the field, scored. I thought they gave Whitewater a little too much time. Uh, Wartburg's defensive coordinator and the rest of their defense did not agree. Uh, Big pick ends the game. And now you have the, on the one side of the bracket, you have Cortland traveling to Randolph-Macon. Again, we all picked Randolph-Macon. On the other side of the bracket, it's a 1-3. The national one in both polls and the national three in both polls. The three is hosting. We don't need to go down that road again. But... Again, until North Central loses, I think we're all staying with North Central. We're all staying with North Central. Um, and so that leaves us with what happens this Saturday, and then we're going to the Stag Bowl. Yep. Well, we're not going to the Stag Bowl. Although I did try to talk you into going to Salem without giving you any type of information about it, and then you found out it was the wrong Salem. Wrong Salem. So I so tried. A little disappointed. I though. did try, um, but. I think I'm still the front runner points wise for. Have we have you added them up? No, but I went 16 and out of the first week, yeah. and we haven't had 16 so games, so I've got a pretty good head start. You did a good head start. <laughs> um, so uh, this week we finished up with a 
uh, MEAC, the Minnesota Conference. We had a Hamlin University next week. We will be back in the MEAC uh, with Augsburg. And then from there, we will, uh, I believe we kind of stay in this MEAC area for a couple weeks uh, to wrap up this season. I'm sure you guys are all anticipating the third annual Ugly Sweater episode. We will be bringing that to you this year. Yes. And we will be taking our our month break in January. So there'll be new episodes coming out, but there'll be some things I'm sure as the editor, I'm sure you have some things that you want to yes. put out there. And I'm not going to tell them what it is. Right I now. don't, you haven't told me what they are. So why the hell would you tell them? <laughs> uh, got anything else? No, I don't think so. You're going to miss these games as well. Cause you'll be at work. I won't. I'll be watching. I always work. And I'm always watching. <laughs> I watch D3 games all the time. All right. So uh, that being said, I'm getting the cue from our uh, director here that it's time to wrap up. So really appreciate you being on this journey. Hope you'll come back next week. And uh, we'll see you next week, Chuckleheads. Thanks for checking out this episode of Dingo Talk. Don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe. For more info and to contact the show, you can find us on Twitter at Dingo Talk.